Everybody, good evening and welcome to Enterprise Tuesday. My name is Paul Bourne and I'm going to be chairing this evening's um, proceedings. So today, um, the title of today is How to Pitch to Investors. So in the red corner, <laughs> we have the pitches. In the blue corner, we have the investors. So thank you ever so much to our panel of investors. They're the real deal. They are, re they are real. I kind of feel like it's, um, I don't know if you've seen that movie, Wizard of Oz, where we get to pull back the curtain at the end, see what really happens behind the scenes. So I don't know which one's the wizard. And I don't know if you're going to be handing out some, uh, is it badge of courage, heart, and brains? If you, uh, you hand out these, uh, these badges to everybody. But, um, but thank you ever so much for uh, coming to be our, our investor panel and for our four um, ventures are going to be pitching. So it's going to be... Um, done a little bit like this. We're going to have a little introduction from the investors, and then we are going to see the four pitches. In between each of the pitches, the investors will be asking them some questions, um, giving some observations, some feedback. We'll go all the way through, and then the, the last half an hour or so, we'll open it up to you guys, and then there'll be an opportunity to ask questions both of the investors and of the guys who've been pitching their ventures as well, and share a bit of information. Because we are um, being streamed live and uh, being recorded, don't run up here naked and streak and throw your arms up. Well, you can if you want, but uh, that might increase the numbers. Who knows? You never know. It could increase the numbers. But yes, we'll, have it. we'll keep it nice and uh, clear and focused. And when you are um, going to ask or answer questions, we'll make sure you use the, use the microphone. So a couple of important notices to say in terms of, you, know, you can see where the fire exits are. You basically have to push a load of investors out of the way to get to the exit. Okay, have any problems? First. They'll be there first. You'll know, they'll be gone. They'll be gone. And they'll take, you'll know which one they've really liked because they'll be grabbing that founder with them and taking them over their shoulder to make sure they're safe. Okay, so, um, so it's very important to know that. Ask you obviously to please make sure that your telephones are off. Um, we have um, phones off, please. Um, and um, yeah, I think uh, that's the, those are the main notices. So a couple of other things to say that we have um, QTech and Cambridge Enterprise, who are here this evening. They are supporting the event, and they have stands outside. Um, so please uh, visit them. And I've been asked very specially to say that QTech is celebrating the anniversary, and they are here. You can give us a wave, QTech. And they are, and they are really encouraging you to listen to Q Talks which are uh, podcasts about innovation in Cambridge uh, area. And they said to say, very proudly, they've got over 400 listeners. They're not mucking about. 400 listeners. All right, very good. So that's the way we're going to go um, for this evening. Um, we'll see how we were able to roll and get you guys all fired up and inspired. You guys ready to go? We're going to pull back the curtain and uh, have a few words from our investors. So I'll ask them to just um, introduce themselves, say a little bit about themselves, where they're from, and maybe some areas, guys, that you've um, either invested in, the sorts of things you're interested in, and maybe a little bit about what it is that you're looking for in a great pitch. So we'll start with you, Phil. You have the, your mic, so please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about, about what you're interested in. It's working. <laughs> so, uh, Phil O'Donovan. Yeah, it works, Phil, but you have to put it towards your mouth, mate. There you go. <laughs> So I'm a theatre director, it's basic, but it works. It's much better if we can hear you. Bill O'Donovan, uh, I'm an engineer. I worked in telecoms, communications, software, and chip companies. Um, we founded nine of us, as nine founders, CSR, the Bluetooth market leader. We raised $85 million, sold three billion chips, and the company was sold when it was a public company to Qualcomm for 2.5 billion. Um, I'm now a Cambridge Angel led by Simon here. And I'm interested in hard technology. I like investing in things that I can touch and feel. Um, I like high risk and high reward opportunities. So the things that I look for, that we perhaps look for, but I certainly look for um, in a pitch are people to say what the opportunity is, what problem they're solving, um, what joy will they bring to the marketplace. And value proposition, of course, there is very important. Um, you know Apple, uh, they like to make products. They say they make product, products that are attractive and great to use. 
for example. Um, business model is very important. You know, are you consulting? Hopefully not, because I won't invest in you. Um, are you producing IP that can be licensed? Maybe. Or are you producing uh, products um, that can be sold in one way or another? Um, go to market plan. It would be good to hear how you plan to get to the market. Um, have you spoken to customers? Are the people out there who empathize with you and what you're planning to do? Uh, competitive analysis. It's very important to know who your competitors are because they will roll all over you um, if you don't prevent that in one way or another. Um, I can give you some examples from my past life at CSR of, as to how those, uh, when we weren't, but how those thousand pound gorillas in the room did actually try and destroy us. You know, the market is tough. Mm -hmm. So, um, we, at the end, um, how would you succeed? What would your value inflection points be? What would make your company more valuable after you've taken the money and after you've delivered to the marketplace? And um, uh, is the CEO, you have to have a CEO, you have to have a leader, not a committee. <coughs> is that person, he or she, convincing? And uh, what is the secret source for the company? Why are you different? Why will you be attractive to investors? Um, I personally um, don't like to talk to people who want me to sign an NDA and I don't like to hear that a company is in stealth mode and I don't personally need an exit plan. If you're a good, successful company, uh, you will have any number of options that you need for an exit. You don't need to plan it and I don't want you to waste time telling me about your exit plan but my uh, co-panel may disagree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, that's Phil O'Donovan. We'll come back and, uh, and ask you a few more questions in a moment. Um, let's now um, go to Kerry Baldwin, if you'd like to introduce yourself, Kerry. Hi, quite a few in, you in the room already know me. I'm a founder and managing partner of IQ Capital. Uh, I've been in venture capital now for 23 years. Uh, we invest in deep tech. Uh, last year, we raised about 300 million. Uh, we go in early stage. Uh, seed, uh, Series A. Uh, we invest from as small as 250k right up to 30 million for our right performers through our growth fund. Uh, we've had exits to Google, Apple, Facebook, Huawei, Oracle, uh, the list continues. So yes, we're well known by, by, by the exit markets. Um, the companies you'll know probably in some of our portfolio are Privitar, Thought Machine, Speechmatics, Consirus. We love deep tech. We love thought leaders as well. So you know your sector extremely well, touching on everything you've said there as well, I agree with. Um, maybe not about the exit plan yet, but we'll go into that later. <laughs> um, what do I like to see? So I'm going to strike off all the things that uh, you've already said. So I personally like to meet as many of the team as possible. It gives me a view of what you all are. Make sure you know who's answering which question so I can understand where to direct things. A lot of teams don't actually do the question practice. Um, I love to see a bold vision. I love to know that you really are striving hard to get something that could be a half a billion or a billion exit. I like to see that vision. Personally, I'm looking for grit. Uh, your road ahead is going to be difficult, and I need to see that inside you and inside your team. Um, I'm looking for a connection. What makes IQ Capital work is the fact that we connect with our founders, and we work very, very well with the angel community as well. And we have to connect and trust each other right from the start. And if that is there in the pitch, the rest of it is easy. I mean, there are so many things I can continue with, but mm -hmm. I, I, I like to see thought. I like to see that you're beginning to even consider ICPs, uh, go-to-market strategy, but I'll leave the rest for Simon. All right. Thank you ever so much, um, <laughs> Kerry. All right. Simon, I'm sure there's a few things left for you to say. If you'd like to introduce yourself, give us a few thoughts. It's Simon Thorpe. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, so, a few things about me. As uh, Phil said, so I'm uh, chairman of Cambridge Angels. Uh, delighted to be part of Cambridge Angels, which is a, a group of 55 investors. Uh, most of them have been exited entrepreneurs, so most of them have already built businesses and sold them. They've already understood the journey of an entrepreneur. And most of them come from a computer science or engineering background, so pretty much uh, technology. But of course, in Cambridge, it's very much about technology and life sciences. These two uh, areas are huge areas of growth for the whole of the UK. Uh, but especially for, for Cambridge. Uh, I, my investment uh, style is very early, so um, I saw some of the notes suggested I ran a fund, but I don't run a fund. I invest personally, like Phil. Uh, so we're different. We're generally much, even earlier than, uh, than Kerry as a venture capitalist. And um, I spend a lot of my time actually uh, getting my companies to the point where hopefully they are going to get invested in by a venture capitalist because 
that's a success as far as I'm concerned. It's one route, route. it's not the only route, but it's a route to funding. And uh, if you are ambitious, as Kerry said, and you're looking to really grow quickly, then you probably should be looking for venture capital money. So a couple of things about, uh, uh, perhaps about me. I've invested in over 50 companies. I've had uh, nine exits, mainly to the Amer American companies, some of the big names that Kerry's already mentioned. Uh, one, one or two, two exits to Europe. Um, the Americans are much more likely as, a, as, a, as, as, a, as an acquirer of many of our companies. Um, uh, a couple of other things to say. Um, what do I look for? So I'm really looking, I'm looking to back entrepreneurs. I'm looking for outstanding entrepreneurs. Usually they come in twos, sometimes in threes. It's very rare that I'll back a single founder. Uh, most venture capitalists won't back a single founder, so that's something to bear in mind. So team, an outstanding team. Secondly, I need to look, look at their technology. I need to understand what technology they've got, what differentiates them. Thirdly, I need to think about their IP. What defensibility, what barriers to entry are there? And lastly, I need to think about, is there a big market? Sometimes I get great ideas presented to me, but it's a tiny market. So I like markets that are big and they're generally global. So that's probably enough from me. Good. Are you terrified? Well, uh, no, no, you're feeling good. I'm feeling good. Okay, so we've got a few more minutes just to, um, before we start the pitch, to so ask you a couple of, uh, of additional questions. So one of my favourite ever um, quotes from a venture capitalist talking about which type of um, founders he invested in, he, he's, it's a well-known phrase, but I heard it for the first time fairly recently, is when talking about ventures, he said, the rose smells sweeter than the cabbage, but the cabbage makes better soup. So taking those ideas where we have some really attractive, sort of um, well-presented ideas, and we've talked a little bit about how we do really become attracted by the individuals, how, how deeply then do we need to go into the business? Which stage are we here when we're hearing this pitch in terms of this understanding of the attractiveness of the idea and then wanting to go very deeply into its viability? Please, Phil, yeah. Sometimes, just Phil, if you don't mind, just to the oh, mic. Sorry. Yep, please, oh, you're fine. <laughs> uh, sometimes the pitch, seeing the people pitching, will be the first time that you'll hear about the opportunity. Sometimes not. Sometimes you'll see a, um, uh, something beforehand, a presentation or mm -hmm. a plan. Um, but the, if it's more than one founder, and I certainly agree with Simon, um, I have done, um, but I won't in the future, invest in uh, startups, opportunities, just with one venture. Uh, it's just too risky one way or another. Um, but it's good to see um, when there are two, three, um, there were nine of us um, founders, uh, the dynamics of the team. Um, you can tell, um, perhaps you can pick up on um, when they present, um, how they act, how they're planned, how they look at each other, um, how they let each other uh, come in with comments. So th 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 that's important. Mm -hmm. Planning, I did mention the word planning is very, very important. Um, you know, the plan may change as you go along in the company, um, but uh, starting off with a plan is a good thing. Um, I think that first pitch um, with those 15 slides or so, if you have PowerPoint, mm -hmm. or those maybe five or seven points if you're just talking, um, is very, very important. And, you know, you can do it ad hoc, extempore, but planning it is, is, is great. And then your business plan will come on top of that. As I said, we, uh, CSR, we raised 85 million um, and, and floated. Um, but actually, when we pitched to our first VCs, we didn't have a business plan. Um, we had thought enough, we thought, about what it took to create a successful business. And we pitched that. Um, we got a term sheet. And um, we then did the legals. And by the time we finished the legals, we had a business plan. Okay. So, so um, you went are, straight for the cabbage. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think, is there a cross between a rose and a cabbage? I can't think what it might be, but that's what I'd like All to right, say. All right, okay. Well, yes, best of both worlds. Okay, <laughs> so we're sort of in a, in a fundamental way. We're talking about the people and their, the attractiveness yes. of the, uh, versus the sort of, um, you know, another, another way of thinking of it, um, when I'm thinking about it, is this yeah. idea, is it both credible... Yes. But also, is it incredible? Are the people incredible as well? So we'll maybe come to Kerry, so your thoughts about this sort of, um, w w where, where your sort of, both your emotions and your logical kind of response to things lie. So I'll try and answer a question there. Um, the, when a person comes and sees me, or a team come and sees me, I mean, I'm probably the last person you want to pitch to, because I actually don't go through your pitch. So you'll come prepared with all your slides, in the right order, with the jokes, with everything in there. I'm, I won't look at it. So what I do immediately is I go straight to conversation. 
because that's what I'm trying to look at. I'm trying to think, I'm trying to capture how you think, how you challenge. Are you defensive? Are you being evasive? Are you admitting you don't know something? That's okay. You know, and it's just having that conversation. So I'm like the last person you want to pitch to. I'm sure my other partners will follow a, a, a pitch deck. But I'm just looking for that conversation. I'm looking that, for that connection. I'm looking how you think. I'm looking how you're going to approach hurdles down the road. And we have a conversation and we connect. Because the most important thing is, do you want my money? Or our investors' money? You know, do you want me by your side as you're growing? And then it's not just me. You have to meet my partners. And all of us will offer different things to you at different stages. And it's very, very important for me not to hear a very formulaic pitch with mm -hmm. messaging. Because it's not you. It's not the real you. It's a deck you put together you think I want to hear. And I know that might confuse you, but I'm happy to talk about it out there later. <laughs> See you outside. Exactly. All right. <laughs> OK, Simon. I, I might attack this slightly differently. So I think of the, you might think of the rose as being the, the elevator pitch. So can you, in two sentences, tell me what your business does and what the idea is? So that's kind of the rose for me. The cabbage soup is, okay, so what's the team that's actually going to execute that plan? Mm. And can I see credibility in the team to execute that plan in all its detail and all its different shapes and forms? So that, that's how I... Okay, so it. how you see it. Well, in a way, we've, uh, we, you, we've covered a wide area. What we're going to do um, now is we're just going to hear three minutes. So you've quite a, quite a detailed list of some of the things we're expecting. Won't necessarily all be in there now, but can we, can we sort of capture the essence of this, and then through questions, which I think absolutely right, is often, in a way, this sort of underrated sort of part of, of, of pitching is to how, how can they deal with the questions. So I'm going to ask our three panellists, if they don't mind, to go down onto the front row, and then I'm going to uh, invite up... I'll just introduce what we've got, and then I'll invite up our, our, first, um, our first pitcher. So we've got um, four pitches, thank you. Um, actually, you can keep that, um, you can keep that for the, because you're going to ask some questions afterwards. So we've got um, four pitches. Um, Jim's going to be up first, followed by Daniel, Susanna, and Simon. They just got three minutes. Some of them have got a couple of slides to add to it. They've got three minutes to pitch, and then we'll have um, a few minutes of questions, maybe a set of questions from each of the panelists. Okay, great. So the first person who's going to be um, pitching coming up is Jim. Oh, sorry, not Jim, Ollie. Jim, Jim or Ollie, which one are you? I'm Ollie. So, you are, today you are being Ollie. Apologies, <laughs> am I? So, you are either Jim or Ollie, and today you are Ollie. <laughs> right, never to be forgotten. All right, Ollie, I'm going to hand this over to you. And if, in fact, that is you. If you didn't know whether you were Jim or not, there's a picture of you. Uh, okay, awesome. there you go. And we'll put that on. Jim knows how that works, by the way. Well, yeah. Yeah, okay. Just check that, make, make sure that's working. And that is for Fantastic. you. I'm All right. Great. Brilliant. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name's Ollie, not Jim. Uh, I'm the other founder. I'm one of the founders of Outfield. We're a, uh, an agritech startup based here in Cambridge. Um, now, uh, fruit orchards, like the one you can see on the slides behind me, are some of the most productive and some of the most valuable agricultural land in the world. But fruit farmers face a fundamental lack of data. And the most fundamental piece of data that they're missing is how much are they growing? How many apples are there in this orchard? To answer that question at the moment, a farmer has to walk around his orchard manually uh, and count a selection of trees and count the apples there. And so errors of yield estimation in orchards, 10%, uh, 20% error is typical across the industry. This lack of data leads to all kinds of inefficiencies throughout the growing season, through the harvest, and downstream in the supply chain as well. We want to give farmers confidence in their yield estimates. So the solution. Outfield is developing a platform using a lot of machine learning algorithms for data processing. We provide accurate yield estimates to farmers and maps of their yield across the orchard, showing them where that yield is coming from. Now, we've chosen to use off-the-shelf uh, consumer drones to gather our data. That means that we can gather data across farms very quickly, very accurately. It means that our platform is a lot faster and a lot more scalable and a lot cheaper uh, for a larger area than a lot of competing technologies, than, than any of the competing technologies um, to solve this problem. Um, we, we're building a grower-focused 
data platform to provide this data back to farmers. And we're building it to scale and to scale globally. So we're, we're launching this as a subscription service for farmers to use across their, across their orchards, across their farms, uh, at a price point of uh, £200 per hectare per year. Um, and so larger farms, you can see how that scales up. We've got plans to scale into the UK and South African markets in 2020 and 2021. The reason for that is it's the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere allows us to gather data uh, all year round. Um, and that is focusing on apples at first. That's our, that's our initial target market is apple producers. But we see huge potential for this technology uh, in all different types, of, uh, all different types of, um, of, of fruit, all other fruit markets. We've got a great team. There's myself, uh, Ollie, um, and if you want to know what Jim looks like, that's what Jim looks like. Uh, we're, we're the two founders. We've currently got three employees, although we're looking to bring, uh, bring on a, more employees at the moment, so we're building a fantastic team. Um, and we're looking to open an investment round, a, a funding round, uh, in the next couple of months. We're looking for a seed round of £1 million, which we're going to use for a, a, an 18-month runway for development of our platform and also to start scaling into these target markets. Um, what else do I need to say? That, that investment round will be opening soon, as I say, in the next couple of, next couple of months. Um, if you're interested, if you'd like to receive a pitch deck when we're launching that, please come and find me. If you want to know any other, if you've got any questions, please come and find me. Um, and if you're a machine learning developer, please come and find me afterwards. I'll be hanging around outside in the networking. Uh, thank you very much. All right. Thank you ever so much, Ollie, not Jim. Well done. So if you stay there, if you stay there, um, if you stay there, Ollie, we're going to have now an opportunity for some questions uh, from our panelists for the moment. Later on, we may have some questions from the rest of the audience. So we'll, we'll go through um, just a few minutes of questions. Um, who wants to start? Simon is going to start so with Ollie, the Just tell me, I'd like to be a bit clearer on what your proprietary technology actually is, because you said you were using consumer-based drones. Yep. So tell, tell us a bit more about that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it, it, the, the proprietary technology is absolutely in the data processing. Uh, you know, we're, we're not building drones, we're not uh, tweaking drones, programming drones. The drones are completely off shelf. It's a very mature technology. All of it is in the data processing. Uh, that data platform, how you deliver that data to the, farm, to the farmer, making it usable, making it meaningful to them, that's where the, that's where the proprietary technology sits. But you talked about machine learning, so what, what mm. machine learning techniques are you using? Yeah, so absolutely. So we, we've, we've chosen to use uh, consumer drones, you know, fan, fantastic, uh, fantastic camera systems on them and things, but to those, those systems, that technology is not optimized for, for agriculture. So we're having to run a lot of um, machine learning for things like computer vision and for, for processing that data uh, to extract the data that we need uh, to, to give to the farmer. It's, uh, I, I, you know, you, the, the drone will fly itself over the orchard. It, it does all that automatically, gathers loads of pictures, which we then process and process again and process again. And then the farmer just gets one number at the end of it. It's just, this is how many apples you've got. So it's, uh, it's kind of a big pyramid leading up to one simple, simple data point. Okay, and a question with the microphone, please, Phil. Yeah. Thank you. Have you spoken to any users, potential users, in those two countries you've targeted to see what they think they might want? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for answering that question because I forgot to, forgot to mention that line. Uh, we're currently running trials in the UK, in South Africa, and in New Zealand. Um, some of those are paid trials, so we're, we're, we're charging customers for a, a basic version of the system at the moment. Uh, we've got something like... 500 hectares signed up for this year in the UK. Um, obviously, the growing season starts in about April, runs through till August or September, depending on the variety. Um, so yes, we've got farmers on board. We've got research organizations on board. Uh, we've got some other um, key players in the industry, people like agronomists and, uh, and advisors in the industry. So yeah, we're getting fantastic fantastic feedback from, 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 the, from the sector. And has that um, changed anything that you thought you would do in the first instance? Uh, yes, it has. Lots, I mean, lots of things have changed. Um, uh, one of the problems we're running into at the moment is in, the, in, the, in, the, in Europe, uh, I almost said in the EU, uh, in Europe we measure apples by volume, so how many bins they fill. In right. New Zealand they measure it by kilo. Do they? Um, and so if you tell a, tell a New Zealand grower how many bins of fruit he's got, that's not actually very useful to him. So somewhere in there we're going to have to work out you know, some form of conversion or something. So little problems like that we're, we're running into all the time. Okay, okay good. Okay. So I'd probably go with more on the market side. So I've got seven questions. I don't know how much time we've got. Uh, well, so cut down. There'll be a lot more in a conversation. So what's an average orchard size? 
uh, in the UK, focus on UK. Yeah, absolutely. In the UK, well, in the UK, uh, an average order size might be about five hectares. Um, maybe a little, yeah, probably, probably about so five hectares grower, is the average. A grower's got. So that would be an orchard, a single orchard block. Um, an average farm size might be something like 50 hectares. So a 10 to 20 cent saving for them is what, what does that equate to on their bottom line? Uh, in, in terms of what, in terms of pounds per year or pounds per hectare? Saving them, exactly. So I mean, these these are numbers that we're still running through with our trial growers at the moment. These are things we're still you know still building into our model. Um, and as I say, we've got a, a pitch date that we will be launching in a couple of couple of months. So okay. all that be baked into it. Okay. So I noticed that you're you're, you're going to the farmer mm -hmm. at the moment. Um, have you considered going to the supplier? Because actually, the supplier end would have more value than the farmer. Yes, and that is that is something we're looking at at the moment. Uh, so in South Africa, in particular. Um, it, it, a way into the market is through uh, the pack houses, so the, exactly. the, where the fruit get collected, they get washed, cleaned, and packaged Producer for export. Producer groups, they're called. Producer groups, exactly. Producer groups, cooperatives. So in Europe, it's very much a cooperative-based model. Uh -huh. um, so yes, talking to people like that, uh, um, okay. absolutely. So who's got the knowledge um, of agriculture in your team? Um, our partners do, which is why I've included, well, NIAB EMR included there on our, on our team. The, the partners, the partnerships that we're building with the industry are just fantastic. EMR, um, a research organisation down in Kent, so we, we've got fantastic partners in uh, in the UK and in South Africa as well. But they're um, not selling to the farmer. So, um, what other products are the normal grower that you'll be targeting? What else are they paying for two hundred pounds, let's say, per hectare per year? What else is on there? Yeah, sure. Is this um, the right price point? Yes, sure. Uh, so, I mean, well, one of the one of the routes to market that we're exploring is partnering with uh, agronomists and, and consultants, people who are visiting these farms regularly. Um, so, offering this as a kind of a, a tag-on service to the the services that, that those uh, those people are offering to growers, things like that. Um, so, I mean, yeah, ag agronomy services is a, is a, is a good okay, example. Okay, so I think you need to work a little bit on that grow-to-market as a, as a sort of... Um, such, and the last thing is, does it integrate with Gatekeeper? Uh, it will integrate... We're talking to one of Gatekeeper's competitors at the moment. We do what want to integrate with the Gatekeeper. What market do they have? Uh, the fruit market is underserved by data platforms, full stop. They don't really work on row crops. They're very good at area crops, potatoes, wheat, and things like that. So they don't really work on tree crops. Um, so we're talking to a talking to a uh, one of Gatekeeper's competitors. Um, if you know another Gatekeeper, I'd really like to talk to them. They're not answering my emails at the moment. So okay, well, we're not, unfortunately, we're not going to answer any more questions either. So it's uh, thank you ever so much, Ollie. Thank you very much, panel. What we're going to do if you take a seat? Thank you. Perfect. Cheers, what thank we? You. Yeah, my pleasure. You, you give give him a spattering of applause. Why not? Why not? Why not? Um, and. Um, um, what I'll say to the panel is you will have an opportunity to feedback some more, what they did well, what you, you felt was missed um, or, or that you really liked about their talks when we come back. Um, I'm now going to invite up our second person who is Daniel. So that is for you, Daniel, and that is also for you. Thank you so much. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Perfect. Um, Let's see if this is getting started. Okay, so good evening, everyone. My name is Daniel. I'm the founder and CEO of Unlimited, which is a data startup that has developed a platform tech to help people improve fitness and nutrition. And the first group of people that we're trying to help with our technology is called the highly active sports people. And highly active sports people deeply care about improving their performance and nutrition. But in order to do that, they need data, access to very, very good quality data. And this is where they usually run into a wall. So if you're a highly active sports person and you want the data, you could, like on the left-hand side, go and purchase a common heart rate-based fitness tracker, uh, which is good for mobility and affordability, but it lacks a lot in the information quality department. Or you could go to the other end of the spectrum and test at sports laboratories, which gives you the absolute opposite benefits. Really good information quality and variety, but zero mobility, and it's quite expensive. And in the middle, there's not much until we come in with our solution, which is called the Smart Mass. And the Smart Mass makes use of this platform tech in order to analyze a sports person's breath flow and breath composition in real time and give them access to these professional grade performance and nutrition metrics that will help them unlock their own sports performance. Now, we're not 
because of that, we're not really competing against companies like Fitbit or Polar. There's nothing wrong with them. They serve a purpose. But we're really in a space where we're talking about companies that care a lot more about the information quality and the practicality of the solution. And while we are trying to deliver similar levels of information quality to our competitors, where we really want to excel is on the practicality department. And you can see, for example, uh, our main competitor's uh, solution on the left-hand uh, bottom corner. Uh, and right next to it, our own. So this is the type of distance in practicality that we're aiming for. On top of that, we have a cost and affordability advantage. We're looking uh, to price our solution in a pay one scheme for around 500 pounds, while they go up to 5.8 thousand pounds for their solutions. Now, talking about that, there's more ways in which we can help sports people access our solution. We also have a multi-user subscription revenue stream uh, which leverages the unique um, functional capabilities of our smart mask and allows sports, non-professional sports clubs, non-professional teams to access this professional grade information in the way that works best for them. Um, our team covers all the key areas that are required for this kind of project, sports science, actual sports, sensor engineering, uh, aerodynamics, etc. And we are currently concluding our pre-seed round. We're actually looking for one or two more individual investors that would like to join us in you know, making the future of sports performance happen. And if one of you is that person tonight, please come talk to me. Or if you are online, uh, you can contact us through our contact details <laughs> there. <laughs> thank well, you so much. All right, thank you ever so much. Um, Daniel, okay, very good. So if you just um, hold on there, we've got a few questions for you. Um, would you like to start this time, Simon? Happy? Uh, yes. So one thing I was just going to ask was the pricing. How have you decided on the pricing? Yeah. So we uh, performed initially, and this was like in the early stages of Unlimited, we performed some uh, simple value-based exercises with uh, the, sport, the sports people, the kind that we're looking to engage with. And we discovered that a lot of sports people were comparing the potential price of the solution against sports laboratories. And when you do that, you might be able to justify price points like the ones our competitors uh, do. But the problem is that because of that same thing, um, a lot of people were also telling us, well, and if you were to price it at that point, then you know, I think it's pretty cool that that solution exists and it's out there but I might not really be able to access it. So we discovered that if we offered a price point of 500, 600 pounds, which is comparable to a elite level common fitness tracker or a basic power meter in the case of cyclists, then that opens up the doors to a much, much larger market. And then the multi-user subscription model makes, works in a different way and it's even more convenient than that. And have you already tested that pricing? And so we are not in the market yet, but we're actually finalizing preparations in the next one, uh, one and a half months, approx, to launch a Kickstarter campaign to start converting some of these people we've made early engagements with into early traction. And the multi-user subscription model, we're looking to do that in the following, uh, over a period of the following five to six months. Okay, good, thank you. Yep, Phil? Um, you used a phrase right at the very beginning, which was something like uh, intensive sports people. Um, what was the phrase? Can you remember? Hi highly active sports people. Highly active sports people. That's not us, Phil. Uh, <laughs> uh, Phil, be highly active with your microphone. I'm there you sorry. go. That's right. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. I'm going to put a sticker on this. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you, Simon. <laughs> and speak for yourself. <laughs> I am. Um, but what occurred to me when you said that was um, uh, communities <clears throat> and market segments. And those people that you described uh, may be professional, they may be amateur, they may be people like me who are very active sports-wise for a short period of time and then, you know, a couch potato for another six months. <laughs> um, so I'm just wondering if you could target your market in a way such that you would be more focused selling your product. That's the first point. Okay. Uh, oh, do you have a comment? I, don't, I can wait until you finish. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And the second is, um, you're collecting all of this data, and data is gold these days. Mm -hmm. Um, there is maybe another angle here, other than providing, uh, as well as providing the data to the user, and that is the uh, anonymous use of the data in the cloud um, to provide statistics and metrics on an anonymous basis for those people who want to improve their performance based on a use of a thousand people like them. 
and, yeah. and what like them is another question, of course. Yeah, so my nutshell answer to both of those questions is yes and yes. Mm -hmm. uh, so fully agree with you on those two. Of course, in the space of three minutes, we can't go too deep into this, but regarding the first question, our actual initial focus market is highly active cyclists. Uh, and right. that's the key group okay. of people that we started engaging with okay. in the beginning. You might already right. be imagining there's a good number of reasons why it's better to engage with highly active cyclists in the beginning mm. rather than other people doing other sports. And regarding the second question, again, yes, absolutely. So I didn't mention it in the revenue model, but we're accessing a very unique data set so there is a number, besides that opportunity, which you know, would allow us to engage with our organizations in this way, there are further opportunities for horizontal growth right. that also leverage that data uh, that we're able to collect. Okay. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Kerry. <clears throat> okay, so again, I've got a few. So yeah, all right, is it less than seven? <laughs> okay, it's less than seven. <laughs> okay, good. Well, I mean, there's, there's a okay, so we, we kind of address the sort of specific sport. So like in the, just have images of bikes, for example, because it makes it just so much clearer. I can see it's for a bike, you know, just the basic images on your pitch. Um, but I'm going to start with this. Optimising what with the breath thing? Well, what are you actually optimising? Yeah, so we're not optimising breath. What we're doing... Well, you, the data you're collecting yeah, is what? So, so we're, it's collecting, here. we're collecting data like, for example, the levels of oxygen in breath, the levels of carbon dioxide in breath, and we are leveraging a sports science called indirect calorimetry, which is very well understood. It's what you do at sports laboratories. There's nothing new in it, but we're replicating the type of tests that you would do in sports laboratories that use this same kind of data in order to provide sports people with metrics like uh, maximal oxygen consumption, which is very popular with cyclists okay, and with runners. But how does that tell me to change doing what? Like, are there other yeah. sensors of my body as well, or just this? Is it telling me as I'm doing something to change my behavior? No, so the way you would use this is like the way you would use, let's say, a Fitbit. You use it while you're training, right, to record data. Yeah. And then after the training, you can analyze that data in conjunction with other parameters that you might be collecting. And then that tells you a story about your current performance levels. And then you can use that to uh, set yourself a certain set of goals and alter those metrics in any. So let me give you a very quick example. If you're a runner, um, maximal oxygen consumption tells you about your ability to endure. Right where you're that's the point where your body starts turning uh, into anaerobic mode, which means you're using your muscles instead of your aerobic system. So knowing exactly when you are hitting that point in relation to the speed that you have and the distance that you've run, et cetera, is extremely useful. And then you can, ma if you know that, then you can manage yourself for modifying that metric or your own performance in whichever way you need to. It depends Re on the goals Retrospective, that you basically, after the event has happened rather than live. Yeah, yeah. It's, so it's for training use. It just looked horrible to wear, personally. I well, was a, a rower, obviously not now. <laughs> and, and if someone put that on me and said, this will optimize my performance, I mean, I'd be like, are you kidding me? It feels like yeah. it would inhibit it. Well, I, I mean... I, I don't know how... Fair, 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 fair enough. You guys are much younger. You'd be wearing we, this. Um, so we've received... We, we haven't made everyone happy with the design, but, at for, but fortunately we have reached a point where most people we speak to that belong to these groups of sports people, like cyclists, etc., uh, first of all are happy with the design. Uh, there's nothing as lightweight and flexible as this in the market right now for these purposes. Um, I would love your feedback on how you would feel it would make it more appealing to you personally, but we're really happy with our results so far because it is ticking the boxes for, for most of the people that we're speaking to. And I say it's a very crowded sector. It's a lot of noise, a lot of people targeting this sector. You know, what people talk about this area as being a bit of an overhype at the moment. Uh, so I think you need a bit more to, to stand out here personally. OK, well, we maybe will find out what that bit more may be later. Thank you ever so much, Thank Daniel. So much. Thank you, guys. Thank you ever so much. OK. And again, we'll be taking questions from the um, audience at uh, the conclusion of these. So the next person who can do the pitch is um, Susanna. And there's your clicker. And you have three minutes. Thank you ever so much, Susanna. Yeah. So hello, everyone. I'm Susanna. I'm the co-founder of Hyde, along with my friend Yudi, who's not here today. And I'd just like to start by asking you all, does anyone own anything made out of leather? Anyone? Yeah, I can see a, three, a few shoes down here. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, leather is such a great material, right? It's flexible, durable, breathable. However, the same can't be said for its environmental credentials. 
So 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions are due to the fashion industry. And the most contributing factor is because of the manufacturing processes and the animal agriculture required to raise cattle to produce materials like cotton, leather, and polymers. But fashion designers are completely aware of this. They are fully aware that leather is not the most sustainable material. However, they are not prepared to compromise on the quality of the materials that they're using. And our consumption of leather continues to grow. We want more shoes, bags, belts, and every year we consume two billion square meters of leather. This amount can cover four million tennis courts. So how can we actually continue to consume leather and enjoy it without its environmental burden? So this is where we come in. So we produce a leather substitute product that actually resembles the quality of genuine leather because it's made out of collagen, which is the same protein that makes up 90% of the dry mass of leather. So how we do this, we extract collagen from fish waste. And there's an abundance of this material. There's 20 million tons of this waste produced every single year. And this amount is enough to cover half of the global demand for leather. So we take this waste, we extract the collagen, we form sheets, we post-process it and dye it to form our leather like material. And yes, there are some other companies that are trying to do this. So we can broadly split these companies into a plant-based category and the collagen-based substitutes. So the plant-based substitutes, they're using plant fibers which are just inherently different to collagen. So these materials are environmentally friendly, however, just different, and they don't recreate the quality of genuine leather. In terms of the collagen-based substitutes, the largest company is called Modern Meadow, and they use genetically engineered yeast to produce their collagen. However, their collagen yield is at least two orders of magnitude lower than our collagen yield. This means that their material is inherently more difficult to scale up than our material. And this is evident because they don't yet have a scalable product, and we don't know how soon in the future this will be possible. And we will sell this material in the massive leather wholesale market, directly to businesses that consume leather. So the leather wholesale market currently stands at between 100 to $300 billion, and it's growing at a rate of 5% every year. And our plan is to start selling our material to fashion brands, although Broadly speaking, we could sell to any company that currently consumes leather. So in a few years' time, when I ask, do you own anything made out of leather? You'll say, no, not leather, <laughs> but hide. Thank you. All right, thank you ever so much, um, Susanna. OK. Um, and then um, this time, we're going to start with Kerry with her maximum three questions, Kerry, this time. Oh, OK, very good. <laughs> That was a good pitch, actually. I felt, uh, I felt I was following it the whole way through, and, and there were lots of stats of growth of market and stuff. So you're going to need to have a really strong marketeer in your team. Who's that? Um, so currently, there's just two of us. We only formed in November, and we raised pre-seed funding in January. So I'm currently acting as the CEO and the marketeer, but we will definitely be looking to expand to a proper qualified professional because I'm an engineer by training, so I don't have marketing experience other than what I've learned. Day yeah, day. You're, going to, you're going to need to really yeah. understand whether you're going to go down that influence market, where are you going here? And for me, and I don't know the answer to this, is a fish byproduct yeah, yeah. Uh, as bad as an animal byproduct to a, like a, a vegan or something like that? Would they say, I'm not touching that either? Mm -hmm. So that is a market thing I would want to understand. If they're saying, yeah, that's cool, I would, I would touch a fish yeah. product. Like, yeah. Yeah, so, you know where um, I'm going here. We've spoken to over 50 fashion designers and they're all on board with the idea. And the main reason that they like the idea is because we can offer them advantages on three, three pillars for sustainability. So water reduction, we can reduce water, water required to produce one meter squared by up to 10 times. Um, <coughs> carbon footprint, we need to do a life cycle analysis, but there's scope to be up to 90% reduction. And waste reduction, because we can provide our material on a roll rather than in a skin. I appreciate all yeah. of this, and I appreciate you have all the answers, but for me it's about the end user, the consumer. Does the consumer who wants to be driven to purchase something that yeah. isn't made of a cow, yeah. Devon accent coming through there, <laughs> 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 will they accept it's made of a fish? So yeah, I, 
I totally see your point, but I think because the leather market is so like huge. Surveys the surveys and market. I'll just do a little bit more on the yeah. consumer. And I'm going to stop now. Okay. Okay. Who wants to go? Phil, but, are you... Um, yes, Jack, so are you going to use? Market switched on, pointed in the right direction. <laughs> um, two things occurred to me uh, that uh, you probably know the answer to, but weren't mentioned here. One is um, the quality of the product. Uh, does it look like leather? Does it feel like leather? Does it wear like leather? Does it smell like leather? Um, so we have a very small prototype and it has a similar look to leather. However, we haven't done full material characterization yet. So we're, we're, we're sure that we're going to have to tune the other material properties like strength. It is, it is flexible, but we need to tune these and we're still very much in the prototyping stage. Right. And the smell, no, it doesn't smell like fish at all. And actually, the smell of leather is because of the chemicals used in the tanning process. And, you know, right. we can use similar and different chemicals to create this smell as well. Okay, good. And for such a market or such a product that's um, going to enter a very competitive market, uh, what edge do you have? Do you have any intellectual property, for example? Do you have anything that will stop somebody doing the same as you want to do? So... Um, when we raise more money, we will be looking to file a, pa file a patent. But at this point, we've got our know-how between us and a team that we've created our first tiny prototype. And also, I think, because the market is so big, I think that's also a, a defense for us because we would be able to take a small part of this market as to, you know, because of its size, I think it's not unreasonable to say that we can defend a niche within this market and be confident that we would still be making a good business from that. Does, does the IP come from somewhere else, from a university, or is it all no, your no, own? No, it's from me and my co-founder. Excellent. We started okay. in the lab in January. Good. Thank okay. you. Okay, great. I'm just building on that question, so now, what, how would you show me that you've got, the two of you have got credibility in this space, that you've got expertise? What, tell us a bit about yeah, your background. So my background's in biomanufacturing and I work with proteins and I specifically work with collagen in my PhD. And in terms of a management experience, I've also worked in multi-million pound scale-up projects for protein supplement manufacturing. And my co-founder has a PhD in organic chemistry and he's worked extensively with cross-linking chemistry, which is a main component of our product. And he also has industrial research experience in L'Oreal and um, Johnson & Johnson. So was it through your work with Collagen that you actually came up with this idea? Um, so we actually met here at business school um, and we came up with the idea kind of on a project we were on and then we changed the idea and developed it together. But yeah. Great. So you've got the great skills, uh, skill set of being an uh, enterprise technology star here at, the, uh, here at the business school. Any other questions? No? Nope? Oh, you thought you had one more song? Please. Well, just this market size, can you just yeah. tell us a little bit more about that? You've got some good stats up there, but how have you actually gone about quantifying this market? Okay, so um, this, these are from, this is from a market report, and we've spoken to some lever industry experts, and they say that this is a very reasonable value for the lever wholesale market. But we've also done a bottom-up analysis. So if you take the average price of skins, so cow skins will sell between $30 and $80, and exotic skins could sell anywhere between $100 and $200. Um, it's about 80% cow skin, 20% other exotic skins. And then you do the top, the bottom up analysis and you get to a value of $150 billion. So it's comfortably within the market reports from our personal calculations. Thank you. Good. I love that, between 100 and 300 billion. It's, I love it. I love it. It's a big market. <laughs> you had something you urgently wanted to say, Phil, through the microphone? <laughs> Um, just a question, matter of interest. Uh, you're starting with fish, you're making collagen, you're going to make leather from the collagen. Has anybody done the analysis that says this is leather, this is a great red leather, Russian leather that they uh, used to make, can't make it now, costs thousands of pounds per square meter. If you take, if you break leather down into its principal components, and the principal component is collagen, but what else? is there in there, um, or is there anything? Those things, other than the obvious things like dye and color, um, will you also need to turn your fish into leather? Yeah, so I guess the other 10% is generally fats, and there's water content in the leather, as well as other chemicals, cross-linkers between the collagen and the dyes. But simple stuff. 
not no magic sauce that makes leather leather. Um, I mean, what makes leather leather is that it's come from an animal. So that's the definition of leather. It has to be untouched yeah. skin from an animal. Yeah. So calling it leather is kind of a simplification, uh, but it's actually going to be a material in its own right, but it's going to resemble leather. That actually poses an interesting question. That is, what is the trade name of the product? It's not fish leather, no. I know. No, it's not <laughs> fish leather. <laughs> it's going to be... <laughs> <laughs> We're still thinking about this together. All right, then. okay. Go yeah, there's a tip, don't call it fish leather. Okay, thank you ever so much, Susanna. Thank you ever so much. <laughs> and then our final pitch, and there's your uh, clicker there, Simon, is from Simon. Thank you very much. So, my name is Simon, my company is Zampler, and we make plastic from peas. So, anyone in the audience under 30, have you ever bought a product from Kodak? A few of you have. That's a surprise. So you've actually heard of Kodak. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Kodak uh, in 1980 manufactured 85% of all of the cameras sold in the United States. All of us of my age and over owned products by Kodak. That's just the nature of it. And my point of saying that is that disruption happens very, very quickly in markets. Kodak no longer exists. These are the CEOs of the largest synthetic material and plastic manufacturers in the UK. These are in, in the plant, on the plant. These are companies like Chevron uh, and uh, major companies like that. These are dead men walking. <laughs> in 20 years time, their businesses will not exist in the form that they are at the moment. They are Kodak waiting to happen. And these people are scared, and they're scared of her. And they're scared of not just her, but the influence that she has on all of us as consumers and voters. And that's what's going on right now, is we are seeing a very, very rapid transition, a major transition away from synthetic materials, and we're seeing consumers finding plastics unacceptable, and we're seeing governments legislate. China banned plastic bags last month. India has banned plastic microbeads in their products. We're seeing huge transitional change. Now, what happened here in Cambridge is that my co-founder, Professor Thomas Knowles, uh, developed and was working on plant proteins, and he developed a material which he realized uh, could be completely revolutionary in the world of alternatives to plastics. And this is a very, very rare opportunity of a breakthrough piece of science coming from the research base, coming together with some major consumer and regulatory drivers. It's a really big opportunity. Phil mentioned that he likes product. I have a product for that, which I'll not to rip it up, but that is a piece of plastic. We're using that as a sachet to enclose uh, soap. That's a piece of plastic made entirely from soy protein. In fact, that one, that's all it's made of. Now, you may think that you have all seen replacements for plastics made out of paper and so forth. You're correct. There are loads and loads of uh, materials out there at the moment. It's a very buzzy space. The packaging market in particular, bio-based materials, is at about $85 billion already per year. All of these are based on plant polysaccharides, starches, cellulose, which are easy to work with but lack performance. So the reason that so many of these competitors up on the screen here are around circular economy and recycling is because to make those materials useful, they add synthetic chemicals to them, which makes them very, very hard at end of life. The alternative is a completely natural, robust, plant protein material, and the reason that's possible is that plant proteins, proteins are performance materials in nature. So my task over the week, to close the finance round just before Christmas, we have a lead customer in Britvik. Uh, we are focusing at the moment on microcapsules or microplastics, so the EU last year banned microplastics to be phased in over the next five years. The cosmetics and home care sector in particular is absolutely freaked out by this and are desperately trying to find solutions. We have a credible solution that in what is a $10 million market. We have a project in plan at the moment to develop into films and packaging, and my plan over the next 12 months is to demonstrate two to three lead customers customers that we can make product to their spec, scale it, and then we're doing a Series A. Now, the dead men walking are not stupid. They know that they need to change their businesses if they're going to survive and avoid being Kodak. And so I don't mean to talk about exit, but that's where we're exiting. In five to seven years' time, my job is to get us in front of those BASF and Dow CEOs so that they buy this company. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Simon. All right. Good. Um, 
Well, Sweet. I, sh I should say, in the interest of full disclosure, I am already an investor in Zamplin. <laughs> all right, very good. Um, okay, all right. Um, well, but, but, uh, well how, how's he doing? Are you feeling confident having heard the pitch that your money's in a good place? It's very consistent with the pitch I've heard Very before. consistent with the pitch you did before. <laughs> all right, well, let's... Uh, <laughs> very good, very good. So you're not asking for your money back. All right, okay. All Certainly right. not. Um, okay. Not. Um, Phil, you want to pick up the microphone? Yep. I knew you were. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, it's a very good pitch. Um, the thing that occurred to me um, that you concentrated on, which of course is very important, um, is how you make materials that can replace plastics out of peas, for example. Yeah. But what you didn't address um, is how that material will also degrade. You know, will we be finding dolphins strangled with natural products in the future? Yeah. Um, or is, uh, can you design um, degradability? Uh, according to where the product goes subsequently into the product. Yeah, and it's a really complex area, this whole end of life, and it's why consumers find it such a struggle to know, frankly, which bin to put different materials in. It is what bedevils this whole space, and this is why a simple solution is there. I'll phrase it like this. Our material is a food. If it's eaten by fishes, if it's eaten by microbes, it digests, breaks down into uh, amino acids and is absorbed and used by them. Because of the acids in their stomach? Yeah, exactly. The proteases okay. just break down. Exactly. It's, di it's digestion. So that is very different from what one might call yeah. biodegradability. And PLA, is, if you're familiar with the space, is, is, the, is seen as the saviour of, of plastics in, in terms of a, a, a sugar-based material. And it is. It's a fantastic material. It's great, pr great progress. But it takes 50 years to degrade. Wow. That, put in the soil, would be gone in three weeks. And that's the difference. So, and, and when we talk about recycling, it's very interesting. In the West, we have lots of recycling options here, and that's the problem we're seeking to solve. Unilever makes 50 billion single-use sachets for detergents and home care alone in the third world, where there is no recycling, and it just goes straight out into the waste stream. Now, if we could design a plastic for them that degrades in three weeks, you're solving a real problem. OK. Yes, please, Phil. Yep. Um, I, uh, on the exit. <coughs> Yes. Um, if you are at that stage, so much in demand, your product is so successful, you understand so much about how the replacement for plastic is used, yeah. and those companies are desperate to buy you, uh, why would you actually want to be bought? Why would you not uh, morph your company such that you replace those plastic divisions of yep. the ICIs of this world? Yep. Well, I would say that my investors may have a view on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but I think that this is a mission-led business. Yes. My plan is actually to be the first B Corp in Cambridge. We register Sorry, the first? The first B Corp right. in Cambridge. I think it's very, very important that we keep a sustainability in our mission-led at the beginning of it. But naturally, if you're going to make major global impact, there comes a point in the development of a startup where it does make sense either to partner with a very large entity or not. Now, yeah. BASF will have a couple of hundred thousand salespeople that have a footprint in everything and that have the manufacturing capacity to make a real impact on this material. So it's all open and this is a very buzzy space. It's not impossible that this might go in a slightly more public route because of the attention to this space. But, but realistically, if this is going to make a major impact, it's going to be through BSF Salesforce and other Okay, great. We'll skip over you for the moment, Simon, <coughs> and um, come to Kerry. So I'm going to ask two things. Okay. Um, I don't know if the first one you're able to answer, right. of course. Um, it was about your investors that you've just taken in yeah. in the round. Did you, was it just angels or the composition of it, or did you take a corporate in there? We took a well-known uh, Cambridge-based venture capital firm who did the cornerstone. Lovely. Uh, and we haven't announced yet, so we're, I'm being discreet. Yep. We also have an impact investor who focuses on marine plastic pollution. Lovely. Uh, and we have a few angels. Perfect. Okay, so I'm just checking whether you've gone corporate or already. So the bit that I would spend a lot of time with you, and it obviously can't be done in a couple yeah. of minutes, would be who are you actually selling to? I know the markets, but who within that organisation? Um, and how long is a trial for something like this in yeah. the organisation? Because then I'd come back and say, okay, the round you've just raised, how long does that give you cash-wise? And does the way that the clients... Well, you know, are they going to test the robustness, the heat, the properties of the thing? How long would a trial before they'd say, right, we're going to put all our oil of oolo oolo beads in this? Yep. You know, how long would that last? And do you have enough cash to get to that point? And then who are you actually selling to persona-wise inside these different organisations? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 That's it, where I'd take you. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that when you have what is effectively a platform technology yep. that has very wide potential, it is all about focus and it's all about those very precise decision-making and matching your, your offering. 
I would say that our end user customers are going to be the P&G and Unilevers of the world, but our actual customers are the tier one and tier two suppliers. So the people in their supply chain, not just the packaging, but one step yep. back potentially, the resin suppliers into yep. those packaging. So those are companies nobody's ever heard of, but they turn over billions of pounds and are absolutely critical to us. What we need to offer them is differentiation in the market, but we also need a way through to offer them a way through their regulations. So, so at the moment, we know there's a lot of interest in the personal care space, and we are already talking to some of the tier one suppliers who supply existing synthetic polymers into the. You know, these are rinse off shampoos and, and so forth. These are these are sort of everyday products. So that's our, our routine. The routine typically is through the innovation space, but because of the nature of this sector, there are all cross-divisional initiatives around sustainability. So you often get quite good traction amongst procurement and amongst production and so forth. <clears throat> because I've found whenever you're doing something like this, the person who actually decides whether it proceeds within a company is a, a, a um, <laughs> down-to-earth process engineer in a plant somewhere who needs to be convinced to put it into his product. Because you're never going to get it through unless you can put it into that. that so, in the interest of time, normally I'd let you go for a little bit yeah. longer, but in the interest of time, you haven't answered the question in terms yeah, of how long are they going yeah, to put it under sure. a trial before they can actually get to all of this and say, right, it can now be used further up sure. the chain. Sure. And do you have enough money on this round to get to that point? Uh, yes and no, in, in both orders. So, the first part, that, so the lead product customer we've got, that's an 18 month sort of program to get from. Uh, concept proof through to product on the shelf. Uh, there's some regulatory stuff around that that we need to deal with. <clears throat> there are certain other sectors like ag tech which have got longer lead times yep. and certain things like packaging which have got quite short lead times because we can get into the systems quite quite uh, more quickly. But it is not an overnight, this is hardware, this is not an overnight run and five to seven is a realistic time frame for this. It's not going to happen. We have de deliberately been aggressive with our financing uh, expectation and our burn rate because we need to move fast and there's a lot to be done here. So my proof point by the time we do our Series A is validation of the concept and engagement with customers. It's not product and it's not revenue. So we're not through to product by the time I do my Series A, but we will be through to some very firm statements from the likes of our lead customer into what volumes, how they're manufacturing, what the launch products will be, and, and what our process scale-up looks like. So I would be thinking about you know the global economy and you know what could happen potentially. I'm sure everything could be great, but you know right. I would be saying I would, I would be considering extending your round to get a bit longer to get to those proof points. Yeah, yeah, and I imagine that my shareholders will be in with me. <laughs> but right. you don't want to be having a conversation, yeah, yeah. you know, because if, yeah. if you've yeah. only got 12 or 18 months, you're, yeah. you're thinking of getting a date <clears throat> together in six months for other people. Yeah. So what are you actually going to prove in yeah. six months? You've got to work backwards and, yeah. and always knock off six months. We have an 18 to 24 month window yep. worth of money. We've just secured a, a £600,000 Innovate UK project. There is a lot of grant funding in this area. Yeah. And the customer funded project was 90 grand already, and that was just one early stage trial. So I've got quite ambitious expectations about how I may increase that period mm -hmm. uh, with, but I don't want to increase that period. I actually want to hit hard, because part of what we need to do is to convince that sector that we have solutions within the five year implementation period of the EU ban on microplastics. They need to know that we can actually deliver in that period, or we're just another clever science project from Cambridge. We need to be a real production ready solution. Okay, good. We're going to start there. Are you, Phil? You you've got the microphone, and I'm so excited. You've got the microphone. I feel I need to. You, you need to ask a question. Simon hasn't had a chance. No, Simon. I, I will just. I'll come to Phil very quickly, and Simon, we, we, we just move on very quickly. You're very focused. You're pointed at a very big and attractive market, but I just wonder whether um, there are other opportunities for the product. I mean, I hear that people are making gin out of peas. Yeah. <laughs> so as you proceed with your R&D, there yeah. may well be other things you can do yeah. with it. Um, so um, I j just suggest you keep your okay. eye open there too. Open. And uh, that may be something you could license out to other yeah. people. OK, yeah. very and good. There will be um, some markets where different business models are yeah. appropriate. And, um, and as a startup, we can be nimble and should be. Of course. Nimble. OK, very good. Yes. We'll just have an uh, observation just, for just Simon. Just <coughs> you talked about the regulatory driver. Yeah. What? What more regulatory change do you expect in the next 18, 24 months? Well, I mean, actually, oddly, the single-use plastic ban in the UK actually starts in April next year. So although there's been lots of talk about this, some of the implementation is, is coming through. That's April 2021? No, no. April, April this month. year, 20. Uh, yeah, this year. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm there. <coughs> 
uh, the EU microplastics ban is a very, very big opportunity here. It's, it's knocking out a whole series of product categories, and they're going to come in a series over the next five years. Now, the industry is different, are pushing back, and they will lobby successfully in some areas, but that's a five-year drip-free program of different industries coming online and facing this. Now, the US, we don't know where necessarily they're going, but even the US is following some of these drivers around plastics. Plastics is, is, a, is a really, really big and very, very fast disruption, which is a great opportunity for technology like this. All right, we're going to stop you there, Simon. Thank you ever so much. Thank you ever so much for your questions. Um, I'm going to um, ask our three um, panellists, uh, if you don't mind coming out, and also our four, um, if you want to maybe just pull those around slightly, um, Susanna, we'll go back. Um, we're just going to open it up now to the audience um, and um, get a few questions. Um, it's very important that you do speak into the mic, ladies and gentlemen. So, um, and I think we'll, um, this is going to be for you guys to share. So, just make sure that is, uh, on. Uh, no, you don't need to sing. Um, so, uh, can, I, can I just see, who's got the microphone? Where is it there? Okay, um, so if we have a question, we've got an op opportunity to ask questions, obviously, of the uh, investor panel and of our um, pictures as well. So let's, who's got the first question? Um, it's over there, okay? Um, the furthest person from the microphone uh, is the way these things work. Okay, thank you ever so much. Um, hello, my name is Sasha. Uh, I'm interested in, in the psychology of investors when it comes to risk. Uh, uh, surely you guys don't define yourselves as gamblers. There seems to be a, a, a science in looking for plausibility in all these pitches and, and what the, 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 the people tell you. So uh, can you tell us a bit more maybe about uh, what you define as risk and are you really interested in high risk or what do you mean when you say that? Okay, let's, um, you want to go Simon? You've got a, you can use, uh, yeah, you've got your mic up, yeah. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Uh, I am taking uh, significant risk when I invest in early stage companies. I like risk. Uh, I don't like gambling. I like risk. Uh, but that's what I, when I'm analyzing meeting a company, what I'm actually trying to do is to work out what my risk actually is. And I am looking at, think, or I'm thinking about analyzing my risk and thinking, as I said earlier, I'm looking at the team, I'm looking at the technology, I'm looking at the IP, and I'm looking at the market size. And that's how I assess the risk that I'm taking on. Um, I guess it comes down to definitions, but uh, I, I, I think that uh, when I invest in companies, um, I do consider it a gamble um, because um, it, you know, something that isn't a gamble means that uh, you actually know why it's going to succeed. I don't know why. I like to think I do why startups succeed. I like to think I know all the things that they've told me and I believe them and they line up with what I think is important in the marketplace. Um, but one of the metrics I uh, uh, apply um, after experience of investing is I ask myself the question, is this a science project? And what I mean by that is, you know, the science, which is the stuff that a lot of you do in the university, it's research. You know that there probably won't be a product for quite a few years' time. Um, there's technology, you know, which comes from that science at some stage, and that's mostly what startup companies do. They take the science out of the university or elsewhere, and they turn it into technology. And then there's a further two stages, engineering, making that technology into stuff that can be engineered into maybe a pre-product. Um, and if it's a big product or an expensive product, maybe you can't get to market with that yourself, so you need a partner out in the marketplace. Um, and then there's the product itself. And making products, high volume products sold into the global market, actually is something that Cambridge hasn't yet really proven that it can do very successfully, although there are many examples of companies that have done it successfully. So getting from science through that set of phases mm -hmm. to product is really what I look for. <coughs> and in a company, I try and analyze in my mind and elsewhere on paper perhaps, um, at how they will get through each stage, how much money they'll need, how much time it'll take, and what sort of partners they need along the way. And actually, when I put my money in the first instance, it is a gamble. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know the statistics, um, you know, 100%, you know, uh, most of the companies, uh, was it 60, 70% of those tech companies go bust within uh, 20 months. You know, five or 6% give good return to shareholders, and uh, less than 1% actually float. 
Um, okay, so, so, you know, start statistics. Okay. So it's about readiness levels, is it? Then. Say again? It's about readiness levels. You're looking for I, early I, readiness. I guess, levels. although I, I personally don't like to use those readiness levels, and I increasingly see them in pitches um, because actually the definition of the readiness levels is a bit flaky, to my mind, and also the readiness levels, um, depending from country to country, that you know, use that phrase, they're actually different, so I don't like those readiness levels definitions. Okay. Great. Karim, come to your sense of the orientation of risk. So I'm slightly different, obviously, because I run a fund, and therefore I am responsible to my investors. So I go out every three years, and I raise a £150 million fund, and I say, I'm going to invest like this. And these are parameters for how I'm going to invest. I'm going to invest in, let's say, 25 seed companies. These are all going to be figuring out their pro product market fit. And I'm going to make nine, ten investments in Series A for the first time. Now, of those seed companies, you're going to expect X percent to die. Yeah? And they will, we will not follow on on another bunch. Series A, I'll only follow on on, seri on, on 60 percent. Series B, even less. So I have to stick to that when I'm speaking to my investors. So yes, I do take risk, because in that 25 companies, I need my outliers in there. So in my fund two, I have six outliers that are absolutely flying, pushing every metric, and my investors need that. But I need a wide funnel of seed investments to have risk. But I can de-risk that. I can de-risk some of my early seed stage companies uh, because of this ecosystem in Cambridge because we have fantastic investors who know these sectors brilliantly, who are taking the investment early on, like yourselves, who know that sector and are backing those founders, and they bring them to us when they're ready. So I can de-risk in certain ways. I can de-risk because we're in a fantastic ecosystem here where you have second and third time founders. So they're coming back, de-risk slightly. And we have to go like that. But yes, I am taking risk because I'm going in as they're figuring out pre product market fit. One customer, does not make product market fit. Two, repeatability does. But yes, I have to take risks. Good, and you wanted to make another point. I just point wanted somewhere. to add something because um, I'd be arrogant if I was telling you that I can predict that a company is going to be lead to an exit in five years time, I can't. But I am taking a portfolio approach. The same as Kerry's just described, at a later stage, I'm doing exactly the same thing. So I'll invest in say, well I, I told you earlier, I invested in 50 companies, but. If I, if I invest in 10 companies, I'm expecting, and this is broadly the VC model, I'm expecting one to deliver all the return from that portfolio. So I'm diversifying my risk by taking a portfolio approach. And I can't necessarily tell you which of the 10 is going to be the success, but I'm expecting one to be a significant success. And that, I can tell you, has been my, my track record and my experience over the 20 years I've been investing. And one of the hardest things as a VC to do is I have to walk away. When I've met the most awesome founder with the most awesome ca you know, characteristics, the most awesome vision, I have to walk away because he hasn't hit the metrics that I've set out to my investors. I can only invest for the first time in a company that looks like this. And that is such a hard decision for a venture capitalist when you yeah. know that company's going to go on and outperform. And that's where you can you Pass them over to Simon and Phil. Yeah, absolutely. All right, very good. Thank you. Um, let's take another question uh, from this lady. Um, in the, 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 the red top on, yep, perfect. There we go. Um, my question's for Susanna. Um, the last time I was exposed to sort of synthetic leather was probably in the 90s, and the main problem as a consumer was that it made you sweat hideously. <laughs> and something you didn't talk, you talked about how you've replicated it to feel and smell, or you can make it smell through the, the dyeing technique, but have you tested it for sort of perspiration factor and breathability? Because I think that's vital. Yeah, so at this stage, we're very early stages. We literally started in the lab in January. So our prototype is literally a one centimeter square, little yeah. flake of material. Um, so yeah, we need to get onto material testing and that will be really important. However, it's not um, unreasonable to assume that we'll have similar properties to genuine leather because we are based on the same protein that genuine leather is made out of. So we are hoping that we aren't going to have this sweaty feeling of synthetic leather. All right, so. okay. Yeah. We, we, we have, didn't we hear the story of Mark Zuckerberg having his uh, armpits uh, dried so he didn't sweat before he went on some of the uh, panels? So we can get Mr. Zuckerberg to try it out for you. All right. Um, we've got a question for this lady here. 
Thank you. My name is uh, Shweta. I'm an MBA student here. Uh, my question was, somebody touched upon that UK largely produces companies which are process-driven, while uh, US is more like customer-driven and then uh, selling at the larger scale. Why is that? What is the logic for it? Well, I, I would start with the funding and the size of funds is very different. So uh, the model in the UK has always been funds of a certain size and they have much larger funds so they can be a lot more. You're also pushing slightly down the consumer market, whereas, of course, you know, obviously we're a deep tech fund, so we're not you know, investing in, in companies that are going to be massively capital intensive. Um, that, that's where I would start. I mean, obviously, one of the things at the moment, you've got absolute mega funds in the, in the sector at the moment, and that is distorting the ecosystem slightly. Yeah, and also add to that, the, it's, again, is the attitude to risk. The Americans like risk. Uh, we kind of quite like risk, so we, <laughs> we're Anglo-Saxon equity yeah. culture. We quite like that, so we follow the Americans. Europe doesn't like risk. Continental Europe doesn't like risk. Asia likes risk. So there are it's a cultural thing. Okay, good. Um, lady in the back there, yeah. Hi there, I'm the CEO of a, a deep tech company and we got seed funding last year and this year we're thinking about going for Series A and I just wondered to the investors in terms of the pitch, what difference is there between the seed pitch when you see it and the Series A? What should I be thinking about when I make my deck? Uh, one, shall I? Please, yep. Uh, one comment that I'd make is that um, you have pitched before, you have raised money. Um, the um, people who would be interesting, hopefully following through, but the new investors will be interested in knowing um, how you've met those value inflection points that you said that you would meet. Uh, it isn't that you will not get funding if you haven't met them all, um, but the analysis of if you haven't met them, why you haven't met them would be very important. Um, so, uh, what's the word? Don't disappoint, I think, is one of the mantras that a lot of VCs use. You know, if you say you're going to do something, then do it. Um, if you don't do it, then be pretty sure that you're going to need to prove why you haven't done it and why there are three good reasons why you haven't. Add to that, um, Kerry? And then from my, my point of view, Seed, you're selling the vision. Uh, theory A, you've actually got more data points at that point. You've got a bit more of a team. Uh, you've got much more metrics. You know what the drivers are. You can show what, how you've optimised your different metrics and how if I do this, this happens here. Um, you, you probably say that the market is moving ready to adopt the product. So when it's Seed, you may still having to change behaviour. Um, so you'd like to see a little bit more of that moving along. Um, and then I think for you, you'd be really um, looking at the syndicate at Series A. There's a lot of money out there. At Seed, you just want to take the money generally, don't you? Um, whereas at Series A, you've got to be a little bit more shrewd, say, why do I need this balance? Why do I want this syndicate to work together? But happy to come and have a chat, catch me for five minutes, I feel like something. Yeah. And also, I think it's wise to think about the type of investor. So angels are looking for a certain type of investment. Venture capitalists are different. Venture capitalists are looking for out-and-out -out growth. They're looking for very big markets. So Phil and I might invest in a business that's uh, valued at $5 million because we think it can get to $50 million. That's a good exit for us. But a venture capitalist, that's not a good. That's not, a good, that's not what they're looking for. They're, they're looking for a billion pound plus valuation. So that's, that's something to really think about. There's a great article written by, um, you can find it uh, on Twitter. Uh, he's written by a Cambridge angel called Simon Blakey. He's, you can look him up under Basil Monkey. <laughs> he wrote a piece about this about three days ago. It's excellent. All right, there you go. Memorable. Uh, yeah, question from the back there. Hello. Um, firstly, Daniel, I think um, just, just quickly, you're missing, the, uh, there's not actually a question, I'm just saying you're missing a trick with the cyclists, I think, and those masks. Have a think about air pollution. Um, this is actually to hide. Um, what's, so in the comparison against leather, sorry about that confusion with the mics, what is the, what's the difference with the, the cost of producing it and what, how does the process differ? And then the actual end product, what's the co uh, cost differential there? Because of Yeah, so uh, basically, Skins are sold dependent on their grade, so they have a quality rating and also the thickness. Um, and typically, per metre squared, although you don't sell skins in metre squared, you sell them as a skin. But for a cow skin, it'll be priced between $30 to $80. And we are certain that we can be cost competitive with this. Um, and then what was the second question on the manufacturing Just, yeah, process? Cost. So you to make it leather belt compared to existing. 
Oh, so because we would be able to provide our material in a regular rectangular shape, you'd actually get cost savings because there'd be less lever offcuts. Because when you're cutting from an irregular shape, it's harder to optimize your cutting. So we'd offer that advantage. So not only would be, we be able to meet cost parity, but we'd also offer other advantages to using our material. Okay, great, thank you. We'll take a couple more questions, then we'll get some final thoughts. Another question from the audience. Um, this gentleman here, yep. Hi, uh, yeah, just a question um, for the investors about just about framing the pitch. Um, so let's say, for example, if we're starting a company where we start out in one particular product, but we think that the vision of what we want to do has a bit of pivot needed uh, for us to monetize in the future. And this is a slight divergence of the product um, in the end point. Um, a lot of times we don't have um, a lot of time to be able to share the entire idea. Let's say, for example, in pictures like these, how do you, how do you think we should frame the product? Should we start off with kind of that small product first and just talking about that, which is uh, maybe a small market, but we don't think it's large enough? Or should we always kind of pitch to what our larger product is? Um, OK, yeah, all right, yeah. I think we've got the question. Phil? Um, I think it's important to um, think about the pivot and how and why. And that is, if you really do need to pivot, um, then um, make sure that you know and you explain particularly to the investors uh, why you're doing that and why it's important to do that and why hopefully that will not really be a problem. Um, but don't consider uh, that pivots are a, uh, an option along the way from the outset. I mean, uh, uh, I have, and I'm sure um, my colleagues have seen presentations that say, and this is what we're going to do. And by the way, we might pivot along the way and do something else. <laughs> you can't do that. Pivots are OK as long as there are good reasons for them. Sorry, uh, maybe I, let, me, let me clarify with an example. Uh -huh. um, so let's say, for example, maybe pivot is too strong a word, but let's say, for example, my goal is to build something like a conversational AI, AI that can speak to humans. Yeah. And I think that along the way, I have a product which is more for a smaller market, but it's on the path towards there. Let's say, for example, AI that can uh, generate blog posts. So if I'm pitching to an investor, and that, that first one is already monetizable, um, should I be kind of always pitching that end point first, or pitching kind of that, that part about um, being able to generate blog posts automatically, and kind of that part is the monetizable part, and it's a problem to solve as well? I think you need to pitch uh, for the end point, but uh, recognizing that the components uh, or the stages that make the end point um, added together do make the end point. You know, beware of saying, that, um, this is the end point, and by the way, we might branch along the way, or even think that we might branch along the way. Have that focus have that target and go, I was going to say, hell for leather. Uh, yeah. for hell that. for hide. <laughs> OK. Um, hell for fit, no. Uh, no, no, we'll go for hell for hide. Um, do you have something to add to that, Carrie? Yeah, I'd say end point for me. Um, and make sure that whatever the IP you have for the first thing you're doing is going to be the same IP for the next thing. Because if it's not, it's like a completely different company. And mm -hmm. all that is is a history of how your team came together, which is great, and I love to see that. And it's like, we all came together doing this. And we started off doing this, and we learned X and Y, but this is why we're coming out for money to do this. Because if the tech's different, and the IP's different in the two. OK. Yeah. Anything to add to that, Simon? No, I think that's OK, good. Covered. All Thank right, you. we'll take two more questions from the audience, and we'll just wrap it up. Um, is there another? I oh, say, so yep, down in, down in this corner over here. Yep, coming to you. Uh, thank you. I'm a student here, and I want to ask investors about your opinions on the phenomenon that many popular startup pro programs end up losing the market. For example, um, the bike-sharing programs was very popular several years ago, and many tech companies invest heavily on Ofo, Mobike. But recent years, we cannot see these colorful bikes. So from the investment perspective, what do you think the reasons behind that? And what do you think about the phenomenon that many popular programs end up losing markets? I'm sorry, could you just state, state again the, the, the question? I missed one of, one of the words. Um, something sharing, what could you just say again? Um, the example is bike sharing programs, such as Ofo and Mobike. They were very popular, but end up bankruptcy this years. So what's your opinions on that? Any other? We've got Kerry, you got a response Con to that? Or? Consumers, I'd start with. Yeah. So it's the consumer behavior, overhyped. There's a, there's a project I'm doing at the moment about 
you know, overhype in certain sectors, you know, and, and some people are saying quantum's overhyped, for, for example, and some people are saying this is overhyped, and, and a lot of money went into this, and at the end of the day, you've got to change the consumer's behaviour, they're either going to adopt it or not adopt it, and I think for that specific market, um, it was down to consumer behaviour, maybe it wasn't enough gamification, maybe they didn't think about lots of different things here, but for me, it was the, the consumers. Okay. There were lots of dynamics there around the whole cycling, so we talked about I'm a, I am actually a keen cyclist, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, not the sort of intense one that we were talking about earlier. It's probably a very slow one, but, but there are lots of different dynamics actually in that market. So uh, if you think about uh, people have already got their own bikes, people are thinking about buying uh, electric bike, think, people are thinking about hiring bikes. So if London, for example, you've got the choice of, of the old you know, Transport for London, what were Boris bikes or Santander mm -hmm. bikes, whatever they are now. I've, I use those quite a lot. But you've got lots of choices. Every, uh, and then you've got <coughs> others that don't require docking stations. For the companies, you've got huge investment in, in the kit. Uh, you've got problems with, as Kerry says, with the, with the consumer because the consumers often vandalise them. They leave them in the middle of the road. You know, they, um, it's unbelievable where people leave their bikes, you know, so you trip over them. Um, so there's a whole load of different dynamics around it. Um, Mm. Okay, can all I right. Just, uh, um, can I just make a comment on yes, that? Yes, please, Phil. Um, it's, uh, that sort of application is not rocket science, um, but yet look at some of the successes uh, in particularly the States, perhaps. Uh, Uber, it, you know, it's uh, ride hailing, um, but the, their value proposition is we make the day your own, and, and they've been a you know, pretty good success. It's all about mechanics. It's all about how you manage it. We work. You know, selling office space. I mean, they, they reached what, a pre-market valuation of 10 billion, then they took a fall. So I just wonder whether it's a question of how you promote, how you sell this proposition. And one of the first investors in, um, in CSR was uh, Herman Hauser of Amadeus. And one of the reasons that we're very keen to have Herman was because he said that what, one of the key things that's really important um, for you as a company is the, the market perception, is the buzz um, is, the, uh, is the PR, and we rather, perhaps more at the time than most British companies, concentrated on that and it did help us. Um, so it's how you, I think, to a certain extent, you know, bike um, uh, uh, renting company, yeah, but uh, are you different? How can you make a success of it um, rather than just be a bike renting company? How can you be different? Okay, thank you. So got, you wanted to ask a question, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, this is the final question from the audience and I'm just gonna come for final thoughts, thank you. Right, thank you. So it's just a fun question on, like I think there's a lot of questions from the investors to the companies about how do you see whether the actual customers want to buy these products. So the proposed solutions that I think the companies have been doing is to conduct field trials. But we have to admit that field trials are basically limited samples. So in your experience, how should companies design their field trials so that the results are reflective of what the actual customers want in the end? Um, I, I think it's very important, of course, for a small company, you're never going to do an exhaustive uh, field trial. <coughs> you're not going to deal with thousands of people um, or, or, or buyers. But the important thing is um, deal with enough of them to know, uh, to try and learn what really motivates them. And that's not something that perhaps you can get secondhand from a commission study. Go out there and talk to people and see the whites of their eyes and see how they're thinking about the product. And not just you know, the users, or the purchasing managers in the big companies who are going to buy the product. So um, I think it's not a question of statistics. It's a question of actually gut feel once you've gone out and spoken to them. And if you, the founders you know, have a, the gut feel, then I think the investors uh, hopefully will believe them and follow them. Okay. All right, I think we'll, we'll pause it there. I just want to just finish up by um, so you, the, sharing the microphone amongst the four of you. Just very quickly, just one thing you feel that you've learned today or your, a reaction to just very quickly to this experience. What, how did it go for you? So we'll just, um, we'll, st we'll start, so we've got the microphone there. Yeah, okay. Just how did it go for you? What did you learn? Um, I think I, I learned to practice my pitch and also it's quite encouraging that people are asking me questions as well it seems like you know other people hopefully believe in the idea as well so that's really kind of nice positive confirmation for me as well okay and um yeah also it's really nice to be put on the spot and have to think about these questions and answer them in a constructive way with the investors and actually hearing how they think about things is obviously going to be super helpful for us going forward so. good Good, and you came across with a strong belief. I mean, you know, they were deconstructing with a strong belief in what you're doing. Sam? Uh, 
I've learned that you're all much more interested in investors than companies, <laughs> uh, which I suspect is because you all have companies to pitch. <laughs> so well, there you go. So you'll have no one to speak to afterwards. Okay. This is an interesting chance for us to practice our, our lines, uh, whether we're looking for money or, 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 or what at this stage. I'm going to put in a pitch, if I may. We're looking for interns, in particular anyone with an MBA, we're looking for an impact investment sort of project over the summer. So if anyone wants to talk to me about that. Okay, very good. Final chance to pitch, yep. Yeah, no, no worries. Nothing else to pitch. Um, more than a new learning, I would say something that for me has been further reinforced uh, tonight is no matter how many times you do something like this, every single opportunity you do it, every single time you do it, it's a great opportunity to keep learning and keep improving. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Daniel. And then finally? Uh, yeah, I guess um, this is a, a different pitch for me, to, trying to fit into three minutes and also three slides. Uh, so I guess what I was going for was kind of mentioning everything and, and trying, to, uh, trying to then get questions on, on all those things. So, so mention everything very briefly and then hopefully they'll come up again in questions. And a few of the things that I wanted to talk about in more detail did come up in questions. So I guess I, I feel like I did that quite well. So Good. I'm going to take this positive, pat myself on All right, pat yourself on the back <laughs> and, 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 give, and say thanks to Jim as well. Okay, and then final thoughts from our three investors. Um, anything you learned tonight or final words of wisdom to share? We'll start with you, Phil. I use the path and use the microphone, obviously. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm the right direction. Uh, I think the presenters did a grand job. Um, I think uh, each of the four presented very well, uh, very professionally, and um, very um, attractively in that the propositions they had here sounded very interesting to me. Um, I was trying to think of um, you know, some uh, positive uh, advice I could add, and I'm not sure I can add much, because getting all of those key points into three minutes mm -hmm. is actually very difficult. And I think pretty much all of you managed to do that. So I, I think you did a grand job. Right. I haven't got anything, uh, anything controversial to add to that. All right, good. All right, um, Kerry? So again, I thought you did extremely well. I thought you compared brilliantly as well. So I would say um, all of the people in this room, use these facilities, use your courses, use everything that's on in Cambridge. There's so much going on. The Judge Business School has fantastic things. You must take advantage of it. But I would say when you've got three minutes and you knew the format of this evening, Always adjust your pitch to the format of the evening. And I would have cheated. So I would have slammed my last slide, everything I couldn't say on. Because whilst I, and then everyone's just looking at it again. Oh, they didn't say that, they didn't say that. I'd have slammed that third, third slide with everything I would have wanted to say. <laughs> yeah? So cheat. Any opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> Absolute cheat. There you go. Cheat. Quite right, too. Uh, final thoughts, sir? Lots of things I could say, but two things. <laughs> uh, firstly, I learnt a lot tonight. I always learn something every time I meet a company, every time I meet an investor, I always learn something new, uh, even though I've been investing for a very long time. So that's, that's the first thing to say. And, and the other thing is, as companies, don't forget to say something about yourselves, because that's really important. Mm. Many companies, they go through a pitch and they haven't yep. said anything about who the team is and why yep. they're, and I'm left thinking, why is this team yeah. knowledgeable and credible in this space? So don't yeah. forget that. Don't forget to say how brilliant you are. Um, God, I was good, wasn't I? Um, no, um, absolutely. Um, no, we, we fall in love with the story and the storyteller. So it's, uh, uh, it's my job to say thank you to our sponsors, Helix, Bitbio, Start Code on Santander. Thank you to Claire and Rebecca and the team for organising Enterprise Tuesday. Thank you absolutely to our panellists and uh, investors. You can get a little round of applause for those guys. And uh, to our to our, our, our wonderful um, uh, pictures and to say there is uh, Enterprise Tuesday is going to be on tour in March at the Brabham uh, Research Campus with a mega panel um, so look out for that um, and thank you ever so much I hope you take advantage of your networking and um, what, what are you pointing at you know, to alcohol or drinks what am I supposed to say thank you to everybody for contributing and um, let's go network thank you all ever so much love to see you